హలో రాజేష్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ రాజేష్ మేడం రాజేష్ మేడం గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ హాయ్ చూస్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ బాలాజీ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ మేడం గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ ఆల్ వెల్కమ్ దేవ్ పూజారి మేడం వెల్కమ్ జోసెఫ్ సార్ వెల్కమ్ డాక్టర్ మనీష కాటికర్ మేడం వెల్కమ్ డాక్టర్ బాలాజీ డాక్టర్ వికాస్ అండ్ ఆల్ ఐఎస్ మెంబర్స్ ఓవర్ అటెండింగ్ ద వెబినార్ దిస్ ఈస్ అవర్ థర్డ్ వెబినార్ ఆఫ్ శాంప్స్ బేసికలీ యూ ఆర్ going with the basic theme of recent advances in anesthesia previous two webinars were on uh, uh, newer drugs and uh, this webinar is on recent advances in neuro anesthesia and a recovery of anesthesia here we are privileged to have moderators dr uh, rajesh sidhu pujari madam and konvilkar madam konvilkar madam she will be joining very soon and well known and renowned speakers dr manisha katikar madam and dr joseph monterio sir i would request dr balaji asegaukar to brief about the webinar idea please dr balaji asegaukar good evening to all of you and it has been a really great pleasure for me to welcome all of you yet again in recent advances series uh, this series we have started uh, this is i think third activity and it is very popular among all anesthesiologists of maharashtra state chapter and in this today we have a very two stalwart in neuroanesthesia who are going to talk about uh, uh, neuroanesthesia field all of you know dr katikar madam she is a very popular neuroanesthesiologist and dr joseph mantaro he is basically a my teacher also i have learned abcd of neuroanesthesia under him at hinduja hospital and it has been really pleasure sir you are with us today and we have very eminent moderators dr rajeshri madam and dr bharati kondwilkar madam so i hand over further proceeding to dr Rake, uh, rajesh and we are very eager to hear from both the speaker thank you very much thank you balaji uh, basically we will start with the introduction of the moderators today's moderator i would like to request uh, dr vikas karne to introduce dev pujari madam dr vikas good evening good evening everyone and uh, it is a pleasure to uh, uh, have uh, dev pujari madam with us today as a moderator uh, her contribution in neuroanesthesia is phenomenal and uh, as you know she is an additional director the department of anesthesia in jaslok hospital and research center she is also a program director of uh, post doctoral fellowship in neuroanesthesia at jaslok hospital she is a blood transplant committee member at jaslok hospital uh, she is a executive member of neurological society of india uh, from 2022 to 24 and she is a co-chair central disease prevention and treatment rotary district uh, 3141 her interest primarily is neuroanesthesia that we know and uh, the, she comes with a huge experience in neuroanesthesia she is also interested in neurocritical care uh, patient safety spreading health awareness and training uh, citizens in cvl organizing acute neuro care workshops in national venues this is something which she has been doing uh, uh, at a very larger extent and what we know that she has really taken this program to uh remote places where acute neuro care is lacking and uh, a lot of training has been conducted under this program she is a distinguished uh, national board examination teacher uh, re- receiver of uh, national board examination teacher award uh, in july 2019 and she has been otherwise very active and co-edited a book on neuroanesthesia practical tips in neuroanesthesia contributed three chapters into it so it is our pleasure to have you ma'am welcome to this webinar thank you vikas uh, second moderator dr bharti konvilkar madam i will request 
डॉक्टर शिल्पा तिवस्कर मैडम टू इंट्रोड्यूस फोनविलकर मैडम Yeah, good evening, all. Thank you, Sams. Uh, it is a proud privilege to introduce none other than Bharti Kunwilkar, madam, uh, who is a teacher and who has a passion to teach neuroanesthesia. Can I have the slide, please? Yeah, madam is former professor and head anesthesia department of anesthesia and critical care at Grand Medical College and JJ Group of Hospitals. Madam has worked in neuroanesthesia for thirty years. Out of her thirty-nine years of career, and currently working as a medical consultant at Neon Laboratories, Madam has received many awards in her career. The top anesthesiologist award in Mumbai City, best professor award at GMC, two thousand ten two thousand fourteen, the Seva Vrati Doctor Award in two thousand nineteen, distinguished teacher award in neuroanesthesia in ISA NAC twenty twenty. As well as awardee of fellowship of Academy of Neuroanesthesia and Neurocritical Care in ISA NAC twenty twenty four, Madam has delivered orations on pain, ah, uh, past, present, and future at Bombay University. It falls in neuro trauma management in I ISA NAC. Complications in neuroanesthesia can we prevent them in ISA Pune? Madam has lot of publications and presentations. Madam has organized and conducted cadaveric workshops on pain management, regional anesthesia, and difficult airway. Madam has organized exhibitions for public awareness on what is anesthesia, anesthesia ICU, AIDS, blood transfusion, pain, and its relief. Madam has a pivotal role in preparing an implementation of PMSSY, that is a rupees hundred crore grant for upgradation. Of GMC JJ Hospitals from Government of India, a big achievement, Madam. Lead role in treating various mass casualties during communal riots and serial bomb blasts and terrorist attack of 2611. Establish anesthesia OPD MRI anesthesia setup and services in JJ Hospital, Madam. Served as a technical expert for equipment procurement of DHS and DM ER Maharashtra. Served as a technical expert for giving opinion on medical legal cases, corona, corona yodha, and valuable inputs for constructing hundred bedded corona ICU and mobilizing rupees twenty five lakhs donation to Saint George Hospital. We welcome you, Madam. It's a proud privilege to have you here today. Over to you, Rajesh. Sir. Thank you, Shilpa, Madam. Now, after this, we'll switch over to our exact uh, webinar. Uh, two lectures will be. Uh, we'll listen two lectures first, and then we'll go for the question and answers. First lecture will be do by Dr. Manisha Katikar, Madam, and I will. I would like to request Dr. Vikas Karne to introduce Manisha Katikar, Madam. Can we have the slide, please? It is a, a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Manisha Kartika, Madam. Her contribution in uh, neuroanesthesia has been uh, so much uh, that she has been uh, handling all types of uh, neurosurgery cases. Such uh, so, Dr. She is the chief anesthesiologist and intensivist at Balwant Institute of Neurosurgery and Intensive Trauma Care that is being it in Solapur. Uh, she is very well known across Maharashtra and India. She has been president, vice president, secretary, and also MISA news editor for uh, uh, Maharashtra State chapter of ISA, and currently she is a uh, DC member of ISA National. And today she is going to talk about uh, Suga Medics in <coughs> Anesthesia University. Just a brief Suga uh, Medics is. Uh, something which has been coming in as a very uh, promising uh, agent for the reversal of neuromuscular blockage and it definitely has a specific role in neuroanesthesia where you know we care about uh, intracranial dynamics and obviously the intracranial pressure so uh, here i invite uh, dr kartikar madam to deliver her uh, lecture on suga medics in neuroanesthesia reversal over to you madam thank you very much uh, yeah Let me share my screen first. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Sam, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I have to be congratulate Dr. Balaji Asikaukar and Dr. Rajesh Tagarpilli for this webinar series on recent advances and neuroanesthesia and for giving me opportunity to speak on a very new drug in anesthesia reversal, that is Sugamadex. I'm also very fortunate to have Dr. Dev Pujari, Madam, as well as uh, Dr. Konvilkar, Madam, as chairpersons for today's session. Uh, Dr. Dev Pujari, Madam, uh, Dr. Konvilkar, Madam, has taught me ABCs of neuroanesthesia in JJ group of hospitals. And uh, she is the main pillar behind whatever I have learned today in neuroanesthesia. Dr. Dev Pujari, Madam, has always mentored me uh, after passing my MD and entering the private practice in neuroanesthesia. She's always there to encourage me and uh, she's always there to, uh, to support me in whatever neuroanesthesia practice I'm doing in Solapur. So let's move on to the topic, role of Sugamadex in neuroanesthesia reversal. I would like to discuss few cases with you all, which I have done in my setup. First case was a 68 year old female presented to us in the emergency department with sudden onset of severe headache and frequent vomiting with nausea. She was hypertensive on irregular treatment. CT scan revealed subarachnoid hemorrhage and angiogram revealed a subject tacular aneurysm. She underwent emergency craniotomy for the clipping of aneurysm. Considering her neurological status, her geriatric age and overall uh, her condition and the smooth intraoperative neurosurgical course, I decided to reverse her with Sugamadex and her recovery was excellent. Second case was a 70-year-old male, was morbidly obese, had central obesity. He was paraparatic. He was having lumbar canal stenosis and he had multiple comorbidities, hypertensive, diabetic, Parkinsonism and multiple drugs. He had also had suffered cerebrovascular accident and has, was on antiplatelet drugs and anticonvulsants. He had taken a lot of steroids because of severe pain he used to get because of lumbar canal stenosis and was already on antidepressants. Because of his airway, because of his uh, central obesity and overall his build, and uh, I had considered, uh, I had anticipated difficult airway. So considering all his, his age, his obesity, his uh, comorbidities, I decided to reverse this patient on table with Sugamadex and this patient also had an excellent recovery. Third was again a 77-year-old male who had cervical as well as lumbar problems. He had cervical spondylotic myelopathy and lumbar canal stenosis. He was diabetic, hypertensive and was uh, having long-standing uh, COVID for a long period of time. I could not perform six-minute walk test because uh, he was not able to walk properly. And considering all his comor this comorbidities, again, I planned reversal with uh, Sugamadex for this patient and again, he had an excellent recovery. Fourth case was a hypertensive female, which was brought in a drowsy state with labor respiration. She had frequent convulsions even in emergency need department and needed ventilatory support. Her MRI revealed large interaction mass lesion in right frontal lobe with mass effect and midline shift. She was intubated, ventilated, started on cerebral decongestants and anti antibar drugs. And after settling her neurological status, we operated her, uh, her uh, after four days for excision of SOH. As her GCS was good at the time of uh, uh, surgical event, and as we had extubated her and considering overall neurological recovery after the episodes of convulsions, I did decided for the fast track extubation in that patient and reversed her with Nugusugamadex and she did an ex uh, excellent recovery. Fourth was again a morbidly obese patient who had cervical as well as lumbar spondylosis. She was posted for two-level cervical corpectomy and stabilization. Considering her obesity, her medical, medical comorbidities and difficult airway as she had steroid and NSAID abuse because of her illness, I decided to reverse this patient with Sugamadex. Again, she had an absolutely good recovery. So while making preparations for this uh, presentation, I thought that we are doing these kind of cases for many years with standard protocols and drugs. So why we are discussing a new reversal agent now? All these years, the reversal agent that was available with us was a new stigma. Then why there is a need of new reversal agent? Is it going to be a game changer in the emergency uh, in the neural anesthesia practice? What is the difference? So if we again go back to emergence from neuroanesthesia, 
We want a fully awake patient who should be able to obey verbal commands for the neurological examination. And we should avoid cuffing, tracheal suctioning, and patient ventilator dyschrony at dyssynchrony at the time of extubation. So we usually we continue discontinue long-standing opioids. We continue them for a longer period till the end of uh, till at uh, the end uh, near the closure. We allow normal ventilation. We allow a reversal from neuromuscular broad. Uh, at least two twitches of uh, tenoco responses should be seen. We maintain normal tension. We continue anesthetic administration till skill closure, tracing or removal of subita frame or change of position. Our syringe loaded with propofol is always ready or our hand is always on vaporizer. Uh, vaporizer. We remove the head pins as early as possible, stop nitrous oxide and maintaining normal tension, uh, giving, pressure, we, giving care to the pressure responses at the time of extubation. We give reversal agent and uh, uh, we are always prefer fast track extubation in a neurosurgical patient so that neurological examination can be done after extubation. So all these days we are using neostigmine, but we are all aware of uh, adverse effects of neostigmines. And that is why we were waiting for, and since no other drug was available, we were waiting for some good neuro uh, reversal agent. And what are the problems with neostigmine there? We need anticholinergication along with neostigmine. We need some kind of recovery from neurovascular block, at least two twitches of tenophone responses. Neostigmine take, takes at least eight minutes to have its maximum effect, and it has a ceiling effect. It is an indirect mechanism of reversal and unpredictable efficacy and undesirable autonomic responses. 37% of the patients have shown residual paralysis in spite of use of intermediate acting neuromuscular blocking agents. And in a study that they have found that in 30 to 60% of the patients, the train of four response was less than 0.9 in the post-operative ICU. Our guru, Dr. Rona Imeder, he has published an editorial Supermodex, an opportunity, change the practice that will make changes in the practice of anesthesiology. This was published in Anesthesia and Analgesia in 2007. According to him, Supermodex is likely to be the most exciting drugs in the clinical neuromuscular pharmacology after introduction of atracurin and vacuronium in the neuromuscular blockade or neuromuscular pharmacology in the mid middle 1980s. So this selective relaxant binding agent Despite its considerable cost, the anesthesiologists have started liking it over the world and have started using it. So Sugamadex is the first specific reversal binding agent, which is designed to bind rocuronium, vacuronium, as well as pancuronium. But when I went to the literature, there are no studies published with the use of pancuronium and Sugamadex. However, there are n number of studies with rocuronium and fewer studies with vacuronium. In whatever five cases I have mentioned, I have used vacuronium in all my cases and none of the cases I have used rocuronium. It has novel mechanism of action. It can reverse all levels of neuromuscular block produced by aminosteroidal neuromuscular blocking agents, that is rocuronium, vacuronium, pancuronium. No, it doesn't have any parasympathetic side effects, so there is no need of giving an antimuscarinic agent along with sugamadex. Chemically, it is a synthetic gamma cyclodextrin, which has a hydrophilic exterior and hydrophobic core, and it is specifically designed to encapsulate rocuronium. It encapsulates rocuronium, forms a tight and stable complex with 1 to 1 ratio, resulting in a water-soluble complex. It is usually not metabolized in the body, and it, it, is, reversed, it is excreted unchanged in the urine. And Sugamadex is unable to reverse blockade with benzyl isoquinolian neuromuscular blocking agents, that is atracurium and cis atracurium. So, if we consider its mechanism of action, the Sugamadex rocuronium complex is formed in plasma, which prevents diffusion into the neuromuscular junction. There is formation of a gradient, concentration gradient, which doesn't, which allows movement of rocuronium molecule into the plasma, where the free molecules of sugamadex gets bound to the rocuronium molecule, and then it is inactivated and excreted in the urine. For the dose that has been mentioned, 
that is for routine use, it is the dose mentioned is 2 mg per kg. For moderate neuromuscular block, the dose is 4 mg per kg. And the highest dose, the maximum dose that has been mentioned for the profound neuromuscular block is 16 mg per kg. The sugamadex is indicated in pre-planned reversal of procurinium by sugamadex. Unplanned early reversal in situations cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate situations. When we need, when we want rescue from residual curarization of neostig means, then it is also helpful. It is also helpful in patients in whom administration of neostig has reached a ceiling effect, but remains at an elevated risk for inadequate reversal. For example, patients with myasthenia or patients who have received high dose of magnesium therapy. It is also indicated in patients with diminished respiratory reserves, such as obstructive lung disease, sleep apnea, multiple sclerosis, myasthenia, and in few surgeries where surgeon wants deep, deeper levels of neuromuscular block till the end of procedures. Few adverse effects which are known with sugamadex are bradycardia, anaphylaxis, and hem disturbances. Regarding hem disturbances, the study, uh, the published article now mentions that this was found to be a lab artifact. There are multiple case reports and multiple reports that have mentioned uh, occurrence of severe bradycardia and assist, even asystole along with sugamadex. And another, a study was published which showed in number of serious adverse cardiac effects with sugamadex. And as you can see that with the increasing years, the incidence of bradyc uh, the adverse cardiac events, events with sugamadex are significantly more than that of neostigmine. This, the bradycardia or asystole that may occur is easily reversible and we have to uh, give anti uh, we have to be very ready with anticholinergic drugs to reverse the action of or to reverse this bradycardia. But as an anesthesiologist, we should be aware of such kind of bradycardia that may occur with sugamadex and another atropine or glycoperolate should be there. Even hypotension has also been mentioned in few studies. So it should be ready with us when we are using sugamadex for reversal. Another side effect that has been known with sugamadex is anaphylaxis. It has been, the incidence has been found to be uh, uh, similar with all the doses and most of the reactions have occurred within minutes of giving sugamadex. The reported incidence is appeared to be very low still it is in the uh, published literature. But again, we should be knowing about this hypersensitivity incidence and uh, we should be aware of such complication or such adverse effects with sugamadex. If we want to give neuromuscular block, blocking agent after sugamadex, like suppose if the patient, the surgeon wants to re-explore the patient immediately after giving uh, reversal agent for uh, maybe uh, unrecognized bleeding, hypotension, or whatever, uh, maybe or within or maybe some re-exploration for uh, abdominal hemorrhage, then we need to be very careful about the dose of rocuronium if you have used rocuronium uh, for the first uh, time. So the dose of procurinum that has been mentioned is about 1.2 mg per kg in first four hours after giving sugamadex. And after that, it has been mentioned to be 0.6 mg per kg. And for vacuronium, it is 0.1 mg per kg. We can also give benzyl isoquinoline neuromuscular blocking agents or succinylcholine in such situations. There is no doubt that sugamadex offers a new and improved way of reversing aminosteroidal muscle relaxation. It has been found to be 10 times faster than your stigmine. A Cochrane database published in 2019 included, 2009 included 18 RCTs and total 1,300 patients, and they have found superiority of sugamadex over neostigmine. Another uh, study was published in 2017, again a Cochrane database systemic review, and they have also found uh, a good recovery with sugamadex with lesser complication rates. This, uh, this uh, meta-analysis included 41 studies, 4,200 participants were included and have found regardless of depth of anesthesia, sugamadex is associated with less, lesser side, uh, side effects than uh, neostigmine. An article was published in Anesthesiology in 2020 which mentioned use of sugamadex can improve rates of residual neuromuscular blockade. Another article was published in British Journal of Anesthesia in 2020, where they have found that the rate of uh, uh, post-operative pulmonary complications have been found to be less in these studies. However, the results are still debatable. So let's consider some special uh, considerations. Sugamadex is found to be very useful in elderly patients. A study was published in Anesthesiology in 2015, where a multi-center phase 3 trial uh, study 
investigated influence of age on the safety and pharmacokinetics of subamidex reversal after rocuronium. The reversal time was found to be modestly increased compared to the patients who are less than uh, 63 years of age, uh, 65 years of age. However, it is well tolerated in most all the cases with no cases of recurrence of neuromuscular block. What about pediatric anesthesia? So, Gamadex has been found to be effective and safe in neonates, infants, children, adolescents with reduced risk of bradycardia and no difference in bronchospasm and postoperative national vomiting. This was the study that was published in Anesthesia and Analgesia. It was a retrospectively analyzed study where they analyzed uh, almost around 1,000 children. However, still more studies with high quality and large sample size are needed. And that was the inference that was published, uh, given in an article, editorial article in BMC Pediatric Anesthesia. So for pediatric promotion, a population, since the data is limited, and since no large-scale studies are available, FDA, have, FDA has recommended not to use Sugamadex in children less than two years of age. And they have also not recommended dose of 16 mg per kg uh, for the pediatric age group. For the morbidly obese patient, yes, the speed of reversal of neuromuscular blockade with Sugamadex is definitely better than that of uh, neostigmine. However, there is a still controversy regarding uh, the, the dose of Sugamadex, depending upon what kind of weight we should use, whether the actual weight, ideal weight, or corrected body weight. There are various articles which have published in BMC Anesthesiology in 2021, Anesthesia and, Internal, and Journal of Internal Medicine, which have discussed the role of uh, Sugamadex depending upon the actual body weight, ideal body weight, or the corrected body weight. The Sugamadex in the renal failure. The Sugamadex and the Sugamadex rocuronium complex is exclusively un uh, excreted unchanged by the kidneys. Their excretion has been observed to be prolonged in renal failure. Thus, an article published in 2020 recommended not to use in patients with GFR less than 30 ml per day. Sugamadex can be an alternative neuromuscular blocking agent in patients with end stage renal disease. This has been published in Canadian Journal of Anesthesia in 2020. Still, there are a limited number of clinical studies in patients with end-stage renal disease. Very recently, an article has been produced in January 2024, where they have compared Sugamadex versus Neostigmine for reversal of neuromuscular uh, blockade in patients with severe renal uh, impairment. It, will, it is a randomized double-blind study, and they have found that Sugamadex uh, uh, has been found to, be, to provide a significantly faster return of neuromuscular function compared to cis and neostigmine combination without any major adverse effects. What about obstetric patient? Sugamadex possibly interfere with steroidal methods of birth control. So women of childbearing age group who have received Sugamadex should be considered to use alternative methods of birth control for one week. We as anesthesiologists never advise uh, regarding the methods of contraception when we anesthetize the patient, but when we are using Sugamadex, especially in a childbearing age group patient who is on birth control alternatives who are, on, who are on contraceptive methods and if they are taking oral contraceptive methods, we should uh, counsel such kind of patients as Sugamadex gets bound to progesterone and this complex decreases the, the, uh, the, uh, the mechanism of action of progesterone and it is as good as missing two birth pills. So the use of Sugamadex is also not recommended in early pregnancy and uh, as it uh, binds to and encapsulates progesterone and its effects on lactation are unknown. So despite its great margin of safety as compared to neostigmine, still use of peripheral nerve stimulator and quantitative monitoring is recommended when we are using Subamadex for anesthesia reversal. What about published articles about a use of Subamadex in neurosurgery? To my surprise, I found only one article that was published in Egyptian Journal of Medicine in October 2022, where they compared Sugamadex and Neostigmine on the effects of cerebral oxygenation and metabolism. And to my surprise, the sample size included was only 40 patients. They had included supratentorial tumor surgeries. They found uh, Sugamadex to be better and superior to Neostigmine as far as cerebral dynamics are concerned. However, considering the sample size, where only 40 patients are included, we still need larger and prospective trials. And this is the only one study that has been 
published as far as the neuroanesthesia is concerned in literature. So Gamadex has been also found to uh, facilitate neurological assessment in severely brain injured patients. A retrospective study which included 1,000 patients where in, 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 uh, in which only 39 patients had received Sugabadex has been published in previous 2022. Most probably these patients must have been intubated in the, pri at the primary level of trauma with uh, rapid sickness induction with rocuronium and uh, with the use of rocuronium. And when they come for the, at, the at the level of tertiary center, they were reversed and these brain injured patients they have been there. This study has proved that they have found clinical meaningful changes to the neurological examination and the treatment plan. Another study has been recently published in January 2022, where they have used Sugamadex uh, after RSI in critically ill and injured patients. We always are worried about the cost of care with Sugamadex, and we always compare the cost with Neostigmin. So, an article was produced, uh, published in British Journal of Anesthesia in February 2023. And there, the, the study published found no evidence of increased perioperative cost associated with the use of Sugamadex in patients who undergo outpatient surgeries. And they have mentioned that the effects of using Sugamadex on cost of care depends upon patient risk, comorbidities, and the admission status of the patient. Adam Gabadex, brother of Sugamadex, is it a next generation of reversal agent? Chemically having the same structure, Already undergoing phase three clinical trial, where they have compared the efficacy and safety of Adam Gamadex with Subamadex for reversal of rocuronium induced neuromuscular blockade. This article was is published very recently in British Journal of Anesthesia in 2024, and they have found it to be effective, Adam Gamadex to be more effective with lower incidence of anaphylaxis and recuronization as compared with Subamadex. So already the younger brother of Subamadex. Adam Gamadex is, in, is undergoing clinical uh, phase 3 trials. So we have to use more and more Sugamadex. We have to publish more and more articles about Sugamadex. Then only we will be able to and ready to use this uh, drug, the newer drug that is Adam Gamadex, where, uh, Adam Gamadex when it becomes available for clinical practice. Yes, Sugamadex is a miracle drug, but definitely further research is needed. And we, when we compare Neostigmin versus Subamadex, the tide may be turning, but we still need to navigate the winds. The anesthesiologist will be responsible for using Subamadex very carefully in selected number of patients and in selected uh, group of patients. So what benefits and uh, what benefits I really perceived regarding use of Subamadex in my practice? The patients are definitely cooperative at the end with excellent muscle tone. The patients are calm and more settled, possibly due to lack of post-operative residual curarization or residual neuromuscular blockade. There are lack of side effects such as tachycardia, hypertension, nausea, bronchospasm. We, we need lesser control of pressure responses at the time of extubation. There are less chances of post-operative respiratory complication, lesser chances of aspiration. We can optimize relaxation for closure. There is increased flexibility of the technique and the pain control is more manageable in immediate post-operative period. So this results in a happier surgeon, confident and happiest anesthesiologist, and much safer patient. So again, when we go back to the pros and cons of neostigmin and subamadex, we know that uh, the neostigmin has low reversal, cholinergic side effects, there is risk of incomplete reversal, and we need anticholinergic drug along with neostigmin. As compared, subamadex, the cost is uh, really high and it is specifically acting against aminosteroidal muscle relaxants. So with this background in the mind, a study was again published very recently in the month of December 2023, where they have used, uh, they have compared restrictive versus unrestrictive use of Sugamadex for the reversal of rocuronium. And they have mentioned concerns regarding the uh, the cost, total cost of anesthesia care, which was significantly high when they have used neostigmin and compared it the cost with Sugamadex. So, to my opinion, I still personally feel that we have to use Sugamadex in our practice, whether it's neuroanesthesia or other surgeries.
but we have to be very selective in selecting the patients depending upon their medical status, their comorbidities, their uh, for neuroanesthesia specifically, their preoperative glossopharma scale, the intraoperative course, as well as what we plan at the time of extubation. Thank you very much for, for this honor and opportunity. And uh, thank you very much for patience. Since all of us are in the learning curve for using Sugamadex, I'm also eager to listen to the experiences of all the speakers and uh, respected chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, madam. It was an excellent lecture. Thank you for that insightful uh, uh, descriptive, uh, you know, uh, on uh, Sugamadex medics in neuro anesthesia as you said we all are going through the learning curve of using sugar medics sugar medics definitely have a role in neuro anesthesia and you have touched upon all the important aspects uh, of sugar medics related to the reversal of neuromuscular blockade in uh, neurosurgical patients so thank you again for this elaborative lecture uh, yes thank you madam may i invite uh, remarks from our Moderators, uh, Dev Pujari, Madam, and Kondulka, Madam, before we move on to our next uh, lecture. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Madam, you are muted. Better now? Yeah. Yes, Manisha, sir. thank you for a wonderful lecture. There are a lot of uh, 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 questions on the chat. Do we take the questions now or take it in the le later part of we'll, the course? We will after, take the lectures as a, uh, after two second lecture. After second lecture. So thank you, Manisha. Yes. And uh, I remember you telling me that... Uh, uh, about uh, using Sugamadex frequently and having very good uh, sort of results. I believe so. But uh, sometimes I think in a neuro case, they take a little longer time for the bis to really come up. So do you uh, sort of time your uh, uh, Sugamadex according to the bis or you just, as soon as the surgery is over, you give Sugamadex and let the way a patient wake up. So what is that? Yeah. Uh, emergence, uh, basically. Yeah. Because that is the most important thing as far as a neurosurgical uh, patient is concerned. So, yeah. yeah. Madam, I just do not give importance only to the beast at the time of uh, emergence from neuroanesthesia. Okay. Whether the how was the how was the preoperative neurological status? What was exactly the, that's important. Yeah. Was the intraoperative course course? Was there any hemodynamic instability during the surgical procedure? How was yeah. the induction of anesthesia? Was it very stormy induction? Was it a difficult airway? Then at the end, uh, was there any unexplained tachycardia, hypertension, hypotension, or even bradycardia because of brainstem handling or anything during intraoperative course? So depending upon that, and if, if the patient is having normal ventilation, uh, if the patient is having normal tension, normal carbia, normal blood sugar levels, then only I think of reversal and then only uh, with, of course, the bits between uh, with which the rising is, bits. Which is the same. The principles are the same. Yes, yeah. principles are the same. The, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can continue. Over to you, Rajesh, sir. Thank you, Vikas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katikar, madam, for the very... Bharati, madam, want to comment, I think. She has raised her hand. Hello. Bharti, ma'am. Madam, you need to. Madam, unmute Karama Lagas. Convict, ma'am, unmute Karama Lagas. Can you hear now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The discussion right now, which is going between Dr. Adishu and Manisha, is regarding the breast muscle and the but what is important while we are using Sudamadex is a top ratio. Because uh, overall, if you take the anesthetic system in the drug regime that we use in any surgery, not neurosurgery, surgery, 
are several drugs with that relation. We are using opioids, uh, we are using the uh, inhalation and so Madam, you are on mute. Please unmute yourself. So oral testing, every drug probably have done that the surgery to some extent is active. Now, coming only to the reversal agent, it's very important to see what is the cough ratio. And at what cough ratio we are selecting our drug of reversal. And in what dosage. So that is this thing. As far as this is concerned, the this will indicate more of your depth of anesthesia. Okay? So I think we should not mistaken for the depth of anesthesia as your top ratio. We have to eliminate each distinct component and the reverse it. That we, okay, my top is completely now has come to zero level. That means I am off the distinct effect of the muscle relaxant at this point, but still my patient is still rising, he is not responding. So whether it is something else, whether it is a narcotic whether it is an inhalation which is acting or something which has gone wrong during the surgery where the this thing there is a play, surgical play and which has this thing sort of made some effect to that area and that is where this thing the recovery is now becoming prolonged so I think it's very identified these components they should not be ignored at all so a very distinct underlying statement I am just making that just See that your top ratios are absolutely matching with your distinct reversal, distinct dose of your chosen at the time of this thing. What is the top ratio? And accordingly, you are chosen and you are reversed. You are not this thing, um, okay, it's 4 milligrams, that's it, it's not like that. If there is a drug has just been given in a very shorter distance previous to before the surgery is over, maybe that the full dose is acting still in the body. And at that time, if you are choosing the form of the number of children that you do, it's not going to act, it's not going to be adequate. So it is as good as you are doing the total dose and you are reversing with the one fourth of the risk reversal is in those of supermodels. So please remember that the top ratio has the immense importance when you are reversing the patient. And of course, over and above, there are so many things, especially your liver surgical patient, as you said, that there are several other factors which are distinct lingering or they are just very dominant at the end of the surgery. So please don't ignore them. Right? So that is the point I wanted to make at this point of discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Konvilkar Madam. Thank you very much, Devupujari Madam. And thank you so much, uh, Patikar Madam, for an excellent talk and a wide coverage about Sugamatics. Now we'll switch over to the next uh, topic uh, by Dr. Joseph Monterio, sir. I would request uh, Dr. Shilpa, madam, to introduce Monterio, sir. Yeah, as we are proceeding uh, to neuroanesthesia, 10, 15 years back, who would have thought that ERAS can come in neuroanesthesia? But if you listen to Dr. Joseph Monterio, sir, you will definitely know that he has done so much deep study for ERAS in neuroanesthesia, that definitely it is possible. Uh, sir is MD FNANC, Program Director and Neuroanesthesia and Neurocritical Care. Sir is Scientific Committee Member, Consultant Neuroanesthesiologist at PD Hinduja Hospital and Medical Research Center. We welcome you, sir. It's a proud privilege to have you here today. Uh, respected chairpersons, moderators, and uh, distinguished delegates. So to my, today my topic for discussion is uh, ERAS in neurosurgery. So I'll begin with this uh, thought of Alvin Toffler, the illiterate of the 21st century, he said, will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And here we are on this journey of learning our subject, trying to get better at it, trying to improve our practice, trying to weave in the experiences and the judgments of others to try to get better. And hence, we always are striving to improve our knowledge and our practice. The enhanced recovery after surgery was first uh, introduced by Professor Kaled way back in 1997. And ERAS protocols have gained 
wide acceptance in a wide variety of surgical subspecialties since then. ERAS today has gone beyond perioperative care protocols, and the ERAS Society has developed evidence-driven guidelines for multidisciplinary perioperative pathways. This is a very interesting uh, insight by Abeles et al. published in a journal of gastrointestinal surgery, where they first thought of measuring the interventions and the measurements of physical activity monitoring in the perioperative period. Now we can see here in the slide that most of us as anesthesiologists are focused very much on the surgery, the perioperative period, the pre-op assessment, the, the giving a skilled anesthetic technique, and then shifting the patient to the post-operative care. Unfortunately, we must try to widen our horizons and have a little bit of a holistic approach to the patient care. And it's very important to try to improve the patient's condition, not leave it to the other physicians to prehabilitate these patients. And prehabilitation is an important buzzword in these days if we want to improve the patient outcomes. So in monitored prehabilitation in the preoperative area, you measure the baseline activity of the patient, evaluate what is his cardiopulmonary tolerance, and see how we beat up to the challenges of the surgery. Intraoperatively, once the surgery is done and shifted in the postoperative period, once again, you check for the patient's feedback and motivation, monitor the early mobilization, and work on to early detection of complications, safe hospital discharge, and what we all strive for, that is shifting the patient back to the community, re-establishing the basic baseline activity of the patient, if not better, and maintain health and well-being in the community to improve its functional outcome in the community. In uh, This is an interesting report in 2015, a clinical report, value-based neurosurgery published from the UCLA, where they studied the patient's outcomes and the intraoperative course in the hospital undergoing microvascular decompression. And here you can see here in the squiggly lines on the left part, the length of stay for brain tumor patients up and the inpatient tumor resection surgery and hospitalization, the direct variable costs. Nowadays, as we move into healthcare, it's turned into more of an industry with the insurance and all involved. So improving the patient cost effectiveness of the therapy and shortening the stay so that he can go back to the community faster is what we are all aiming at. So we can see here, they monitored the goals that the patient achieved immediate at uh, the, in the immediate post-operative period. And they saw here that patients in the last six months, which they have monitored, elective cranial neurosurgery patients, they all improved the and achieved the goals which they were intended to achieve in the post-operative period so that they could be discharged from the intensive care unit as well as from the hospital early. ERAS in neurosurgery, which is a topic of mine, is uh, currently the protocols are being established and owing to the ra rapid worldwide development of neurosurgery in recent decades, minimally invasive craniotomy, craniotomies for aneurysms being done on a DAK basis have all been implemented in North America and in Canada, and they have benefited a huge number of patients. These protocols have consistently been shown to decrease length of stay, cost of hospitalization, rehospitalization, and the perioperative complications by about 30 to 50 percent. I want to stress at this, at this moment, when we speak of ERAS in neurosurgery, we are not talking about day care surgery. We are not talking of only fast track surgery. And it's not just about moving the patient quickly through the hospital, but we are looking at enhanced recovery of the patient back to the community. The first uh, good article was in, in oncological craniotomies, was it published in the Journal of Clinical Neurosciences in 2016 by Hagen et al., where Hagen et al. used the great criteria for providing best practice recommendations based on the evidence at that time in a systematic review. And of the initial 551 patients that he retrieved, only 67 patients, uh, papers were relevant, including 28 RCTs, 16 systematic reviews of meta-analysis, six prospective and six retrospective cohort studies. And from what they in, uh, found out was of the intervention that were reviewed, although they made intuitive sense, the level of evidence ranged from low to moderate and the final product presented recommendations related to 17 different domains pre, intra, and post-operative care. These are the domains with, which Hagen et al. described for oncocraniotomies that you can see here, pre-operative, intra-operative, and post-operative to make it a little easier for you 
I have heightened the values which the anesthesiologist will be involved in in blue. In the pre-operative period, it is alcohol smoking cessation, which we always do for our patients, nutritional and status and immune nutrition and antithromboelectric prophylaxis. But in the intraoperative period, they focused on fluid and hemodynamic management, scalp lock, total intravenous anesthesia, shorter acting opioids, and avoidance of hypothermia. And in the post-operative period, use of non-opioid and NSAIDs and uh, non-opioid analgesia, controlling nausea and vomiting and early mobilization and avoidance of hypothermia with improved post-op nutrition. This is another excellent article by Nuria Martin, Ricardo Valero et al. This is a Spanish group, experience of fast-track post-operative care after deep brain stimulation surgery. And they studied 19 patients and they found that the fast type discharge protocol is a safe and post operative care after DBS. And there was a small percentage of complications which occurred in those patients, which could occur mainly within the first six hours. Coming closer to home, enhanced recovery after surgery on the neuroanesthesia perspective, published by our uh, friends and colleagues from uh, All India Institute of uh, Medical Sciences, New Delhi, Rajiv Mishra, Indu Kapoor, Chadu Mahajan, and Himanshu Prabhakar. They uh, reviewed this uh, with the various aspects of ERAS and its implementation in neurosurgical practice. And they found that some of the concepts may not be applicable in the setting of neurosurgery. This was uh, some time ago. Moving on, development of enhanced recovery after surgery, the ERAS approach for lumbar spinal fusion surgery by Michael Wang et al. from Miami, Florida. They implemented ERAS protocols in spine surgery, but they chose minimally invasive spine surgery. And they've said that this report demonstrated the first foray of these principles with a patient-focused approach. And uh, I've heightened here in red uh, boxes where the anesthesiologist was involved. So interestingly, these were done under MAC anesthesia. No general anesthesia was given. It was just given with regional techniques and uh, longer-acting opioids and anesthetic agents were avoided. And once again, they focused on hypothermia, avoiding hypotension and appropriate fluid balance by appropriate non-invasive cardiac output monitoring and for with minimally invasive monitoring for the fluid status during the operation and hypovolemia to be avoided. We can see here in this chart where they have plotted insulin sensitivity tissue damage with time. And you can see here in these lines, the red lines are the traditional surgery as the blue line shows the ERAS K protocols. You can see here that those patients who underwent ERAS care had better post-operative outcomes and they had less, they had better insulin sensitivity and less tissue damage. This is another interesting article, Enhanced Recovery After Neurosurgery, a Paradigm Shift and Call to Arms by Neha Dangavich et al. published in World Neurosurgery in April 2017. And they uh, commented that is, there's, a better, there's a need to, for a better understanding of the multimodal pathways. They further enhanced those domains which I spoke about by introduced by Hagen et al. Pre-operative, intraoperative, and post-operative. And in the pre-operative, they added pre-operative comprehensive geriatric assessments with geriatricians, perioperative pharmacological and non-pharmacological pain management, patient-centered decision-making tools for surgery like 3D stimulation for operative planning, prehabilitation, remote monitoring of activity levels at home and pre-admission counseling. Intraoperatively, once again, it focused on monitoring, understanding the variabilities of steroid dosing and tapering, hemodynamic and blood product administration, seizure profile access has been introduced, and uh, expectant complex extubation plans to prevent reintubation. And in the post-op, they introduced GI profile access, steroids, preventing fluid overload and non-narcotic analgesics, and also to pull out unnecessary drains. This is a further study by Marco Carnolio et al. Enhanced recovery after spine surgery, the review of the literature. They also found a lot of beneficial effects of using the ERAS protocols in spine surgery. So you can see here, it has uh, been established well in spine surgery and we are still to implement them in the neurosurgery for craniotomies and other neurosurgeries. This is an interesting article by a Chinese group where they did an interesting part is they took patient feedback in the perioperative period and they analyze the patient feedback. See, whenever we do any surgery, it's very important or anything in life, it's good to have feedback from the person so we can 
improve ourselves. That's what we call an iterative approach. You, you implement something, you analyze it, and get back to trying to improve your performance. So here, with the patient feedback taken by, and analyzed, they were able to improve their protocols. Yet another Chinese group present, uh, presenting successful uh, implementation of enhanced recovery after surgery protocols with reduced nausea and vomiting. And here you can see their flowchart, what they have done is they gave, introduced a scalp nerve block. Rather than putting a catheter, they introduced the use of diapers, use of EMLA cream to securing the arterial or, and venous cannulations. So such sort of small, interesting things which we can easily introduce in our practice were introduced by them. Once again, our authors from All India Institute wrote this interesting letter to the editor to the Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesiology in 2021. Indu Kapoor, uh, Charu Mahajan and Jhamanshu Prabhakar. So they did a review of the literature till then and they, the findings of their systematic review suggested that an ERAS approach is not superior to conventional management of patients undergoing craniotomy compared to conventional management in an ERAS approach. This is an uh, interesting questionnaire-based uh, study that was done and published in Journal of Clinical Neuroscience by Pratik Agarwal, Ilya Fries et al. The Neurosurgical Perception of Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Protocols. And here you can see they had a questionnaire, only 39 uh, responses to their questionnaire. It was just a yes, no, how many of them use ERAS and how many of them don't use it. And then they also try to quantify which of the patients underwent which specific kind of surgery, spine surgery, cranial surgery, other surgeries or in none. And they also checked whether it was an academic institution or a non-academic institution. And they also quantified that the responses that were coming from where. So you can see here the takeoff is a little more in a, an academic institution rather than a non-academic institution. This is an interesting article, real-world implementation of neurosurgical enhanced recovery after surgery protocols for gliomas in patients undergoing elective craniotomies. Once again, it's a Chinese group. 151 patients were enrolled, and uh, they found that there was no 30-day readmission for those patients in either group. The time to first oral intake, urinary catheter removal within first 24 hours and early ambulation were earlier and shorter in the ERAS group. And, but the other objective assessments that they did, there was not any significant difference. So this is quantified in the next slide. See here, you can see the flow, working flow for those patients that who came, the pre-op counseling assessment in the perioperative carbohydrate loading, lung function exercises, avoiding hypothermia interoperatively, and onwards you go to the post-operative period. Very important for to be noted is the DVD profile axis. And in the post-operative period, the patient going back. These are the this uh, diagram shows you the compliance of the patients to the ERAS protocols in the pre-operative uh, phase, in pre-operative phase, and in the post-operative phase. You can see here in the pre-operative phase, the patient compliance was not too good. It gets better intraoperatively, and post-operatively, it is uh, also not as desired. The blue chart, the, the blue area under the curve shows you the compliance, whereas those in the pink or the red is those patients that were non-compliant. And here, this shows you the dynamic changes in the Karnofsky performance scores in the ERAS group and in the control group. And here, you can see the anxiety scores and depression scores in the ERAS group on admission, on discharge, and here you can see the depression scores uh, chart on admission and discharge. So we, not much significant statistical difference in this. Now, one thing I want to focus on is prehabilitation and enhanced recovery after surgery or both. This is an excellent article, I think, which everyone must read. This is published in British Journal of Anesthesia, and uh, it's a must read for all. It focuses on what exactly is prehabilitation. So enhanced recovery after surgery is something that includes prehabilitation and prehabilitation does not always be a part, can, cannot necessarily be a part of enhanced recovery protocol. So here we can see the surgical stress response. So once a surgical stress response occurs at the injury site, the sympathetic nervous stimulation occurs with the release of humoral agents and the neural impulses 
going up to the hypothalamo pituitary axis, counter-regulatory hormones and cytokines are released, which have an action on the muscle mass, causing whole body uh, protein catabolism, leading to glycolysis, proteolysis, with the release of lactates, amino acids, and glycerol. This leads to gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, and the release of acute phase proteins. This in, in turn leads to hyperglycemia and the glucose intolerance and in, in insulin resistance we spoke about, which leads to poorer outcomes in these patients. So these are the prehabilitation components, nutrition, exercise, and psychosocial. Each of them have to be dealt with uh, separately and the interventions are different. Now, what I want to stress upon here is that with prehabilitation, it enhances the physiological reserve and the function of the patient, which improves the patient's response to stress, and hence it improves surgical outcomes. So we can see here in the preoperative patient, you can see the patient of a person who's a bit on the borderline. If he undergoes prehabilitation, the margin of safety that patient will improve as his cardiopulmonary reserve improves, and the patient gets a better margin of safety to deal with the insult or the stimulus of the surgery. Keeping all these things in mind, uh, we decided to explore what is the response to ERAS in India. So me with uh, my students, Dr. Unmesh Bedekar, uh, who was in Hinduja Hospital then, and uh, my coll colleagues, uh, Dr. Gauri Ganga Ketkar and Dr. Madhvi Desai from Tata Memorial Hospital, we collaborated and we decided to put up a questionnaire the questionnaire was uh, designed and uh, screened and it also was validated by experts with a very uh, good uh, internal validity with a Cronbach Alpha score of 0.79. And this was circulated to all uh, members we could reach out to, members of the Indian Neuroanesthesia and Critical Care Society. So it reached up to about 690 respondents. And this was sent by both by email and in WhatsApp and we waited for their responses, and then we analyzed the results. So we can see here the results which we got. I think they were uh, promising, and this was published as a clinical communication in the Indian Journal of Anesthesia. So 54% said that they're using it in spine surgery, 33.3 in awake craniotomies, 29.6 said they use it in supratentorial surgeries, 17.6 said they used in posterior fossa surgeries, 16% in aneurysm surgeries, and 46.4 in all surgeries. So you can see the pre-operative bundles, intraoperative bundles, and the post-operative bundles, and how they were implemented. So I think uh, with more um, enthusiasm and interest among the neuroanesthesiologists, surgeon education, and being a little more aware of how we can improve the outcomes beyond just giving a good neuroanesthesia will be very important. It need not necessarily be an academic institution, because many people are working, doing extremely good work in, uh, in a non-academic institution as well and with larger numbers. So we, we need to collaborate. This is one thing we decide, we uh, found out. Collaboration between institutions helps you to do better research and reach out to a larger audience. And that can also improve outcomes in a bigger way rather than focusing on only on your individual practices and individual institution uh, uh, practice and outcomes. So we also implemented the use of ultrasound guided scalp nerve block to, as a part of improving it. But I will uh, hasten to add that the ultrasound guided scalp nerve block need not necessarily be done because it is best done when the nerve is located close to a vascular structure. This is another interesting article by Indian colleagues, uh, Swagata Tripatiyal from Ames Bhubaneswar, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery in Elective Craniotomies, a Non-Randomized Control Trial. And they also concluded that a significant reduction in the proportion of patients requiring ICU and HDU stay for longer than 48 hours. There were better pain and glycemic control in the post-operative period. And they uh, uh, added that we must have much more extensive randomized control trials to confirm these results. So... To, I'll leave you with a thought by Carl Jung, my favorite philosopher, for better to come, good must stand aside. So my take-home message to you is there is a need for better understanding, standardizing, and consensus building on the multimodal pathways for optimizing perioperative care in elective neurosurgeries. Dedicated pathways have the potential 
to reduce stay and cost of hospitalization and improve functional outcomes and patient satisfaction after elective cranial and spinal procedures, and further assessment of ERAS protocols in neurosurgery by multicentric trials is the way forward. Thank you. Shilpa, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, sir. Yes. Uh, thank, uh, you, thank you, you. Dr. Montero, uh, for a great lecture. Uh, yes, Rajesh. Uh, yes, moderator's now... opinion will take moderator's opinion. Yes. And then we'll go for question and answer. Yes. yes. Moderator's uh, opinion. Uh, Dr. Dev Pujari, ma'am. Can we have your opinion? Okay, we have political political madam. Yes, ma'am. Bharti, ma'am, you would like to comment? Yeah. Anyway, Dr. Joseph, that was wonderful. That was really, really the need of the day that we start using this. Uh, I mean, the fact it is called as ERAS makes it a little bit difficult for us to understand. But we change our practices to sort of get a better perioperative care. A patient who's on his feet faster, who goes home earlier, better, with a better nutrition and uh, less amount of immune response. So there is something called as immune nutrition also, which can... Madam, you're on. Madam, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, uh, right. Shilpa, can you ask? Uh, I mean, carry further. Oh, Bharti would like to talk. Yeah, Bharti, madam. Uh, yeah. Congratulations for such an extensive uh, insight on this topic, which is very poorly understood and poorly studied. Um, the, the origin of ERAS basically has come from the polar axis trading and then it went down to other non neurosurgical distinct places. Where the distinct the surgeons have uh, really uh, understood the thing, the importance of ERAS. And uh, later on, the distinct anesthetists also started understanding that what it is, ERAS means, and how anesthesiologists can play a vital role into the entire ERAS process. Um, just a distinct, a, a very distinct crude comment that okay, middle surgical equation means okay, it's halfway gone case. That is our understanding of everybody. Everybody, I'm saying, for the relatives, for the doctors, are hoga to hoga, nahi to nahi hoga. But then today, that is not the scenario. With many receive good drugs coming in, many technology coming in, people getting trained with this technology. The neurosurgical results are extraordinarily good. Means over the 30 years practice of my neurosurgery, what I have seen at the end of my receiving the clinical practice, it was amazing, amazing spectrum. Like I used to see that the patient every day going to the ICU or for the ventilation. And at the end of my career, I almost saw that every patient of my was able exhibited and gone to the ward. So that was the discovery pattern. Now the newer and newer thing and newer concept like it has come in, I'm sure that in next decade, we will see that we can really think of most of the distinct neurosurgical cases coming in for the day case only. I'm not talking about the distinct with trainer or other things, maybe the other surgeries. But of course, a lot of education is also required for the distinct patient's relative. Okay, when we are talking about the ERAS in neurosurgical patient, because our patient population, their relatives, they have a different mindset, they have different socio-economic background. So therefore, all those things we have to listen, we have to take a lot of efforts to the seniors and then ourselves to the listening in the community also. So a congratulations to really did. But uh, I would uh, this thing that uh, People have been using, I have been using skull block, I have been using uh, taking all the lines and the anesthesia 
and maybe on the wide solution or maybe on this thing. So that lesser and lesser thing is there. A lesser amount of this thing, you know, we need to use. Uh, we started using infusion of this thing, uh, muscle relaxant, so that we can switch up very fast and then we can do a separation. Uh, I'm just plumbing on this thing subject here that uh, Manisha talked about Sudha Madhach. Sudha Madhach actually was this thing declared in 2007 in Taiwan and Vietnam. And uh, I was one of the person present during that summit. And I was really, really thrilled. To, okay, when are we going to get this uh, kind of a drug in India? Okay, so that was my this thing. And when the Sudha Madhach is coming. But uh, we are just practitioners here and we have to wait and watch when our industry will give such drug to us. Now, it is after almost 20 years that now Sugar Medics is available. And uh, unfortunately, I am not, uh, no more in the clinical practice to see it. So, but then sometimes I do go and see people using Sugar Medics and their effects. So, I am very happy that this drug has ultimately has come. Now, just pros and cons that, okay, cost-wise, I think may be expensive. And uh, maybe it, it will definitely require a top monitoring, in my opinion. But you have to have a top monitoring when you are using sugar medics. So your results are absolutely 100%. See, when you want 100%, your paraphernalia has to be 100%. Without that, you can't say that to okay. I did it, but it did not happen. That cannot be done. So top monitoring is very essential. At least you should know what is the top one when you are using. So you have chosen the same, the right amount of this thing, your vessel. Uh, um, uh, dosage. <laughs> you are not just here by area, you are you're not just a single factory in front of me. It is another thing. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You should not think about cost. Uh, you should not think about Okay. Okay. So I think we should be keeping it in mind then when we are using the millions and millions of recent rupees and crores of rupees in India to buy their equipment and to you know, see that their surgeries have been done very recently accurately. Why can't we use safer drugs for our patients so that our patients are safe and we end up with anesthesia? And no anesthesia is blamed for anything goes wrong. Okay? It is always a blame game when something goes wrong. The waste of anesthesia is over also. It, it could be anything intraoperative that has gone unnoticed or it can be twisted inevitably. Okay, whatever it is. Like, so I think we should be, we should stand by very strongly when we want to use such drugs which are very useful to our patient and to our practice. And it take, takes us away from the cases of medical medication uh, problems later on. So it is my very humble request for all of you to this thing. You should be seeing in your mind when you use it. It's not only Sudamide. It's anything that you want for the safety of your patient for the safety of your listening outcome of the patient and safety of yourself as a practitioner. So you should use that. Uh, Manisha has almost covered up many things uh, and I think she gave the whole spectrum of I have nothing to talk. Um, since uh, I'm not talking today as a listening representative of any pharma company which has come up with the drug, I'm just an MSG that we want to mention. But then since I've gone through the process of getting the Sudamidex in India, how it came and how the company made the efforts to get the district. It is a very painful process and a lot of hurdles are there and they have come across all the hurdles and finally they have brought the decision drugs here. One or two companies are there. I think you guys must be using any one of them at least. But they see that you use it in a number of cases, you connect the district experience, you share with all your if you are listening, your uh, colleagues, those who are practicing on such platforms or even with the distinct personal communication so that everybody gets the enthusiasm of this you know, learning and practicing those new techniques. So that's my humble request on this platform to everybody to like and enjoy. Um, as far as Iras is concerned, many things that we are uh, were practicing, but then they will not be collective efforts. So uh, Joseph, I think uh, uh, some of us, at least in Bombay, should be and form a decision, you know, formulate a decision guidelines, guidelines, that you would keep under the ARCC protocol for your surgery. You should practice this, 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 and you should do the study at least in 100 cases and present the data. 
because I think Bombay is still really lacking, you know, presenting and collecting the data and putting forward in the rest of the country. Whereas the rest of the country has this thing much lesser we see in the volume of clinical work. Bombay has much, 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 much larger we see in the clinical work every day happening. But uh, we lack in presenting the our data and communicating to the entire So I think this again a request to Dr. Dorothy Gary Madam who is present. She also does a lot of research in the technique, more technologies and technology and other things uses to there. Maybe others are here also they are still doing this is that we form a protocol of Iras and uh, Manisha is here, she does a listen of a few of these. And uh, we, we, we go ahead and we see if you can be stringent, we follow this Iras protocol. This is the outcome. What are we adding better to our distinct patient recovery and what the thoughts we have in our protocol that will come to know when we do 200 of cases. That's the request again. Um, Manisha, you said about the bradycardia of uh, this thing, but uh, I'm hypersensitive, but actually, I've explored a lot of things. This thing. The incidence of this hypersensitive is much, much, much less. It is just high in some of its studies. It is running 1,000. Some people say it's 1 in 2,073. Some people say 1 in 200. But then, actually, it is not 7. Some of the reports of accidentally they have given a very large dose of the money, so they feel of 96 milligrams at one incident, and nothing has happened. The other, if I have to highlight few beauties of the same sugar minutes, that uh, so those adjustment in the entire age group, right, from the pediatric to geriatric, it's much, much less. We can almost use the similar drug, maybe the time factor will change a little bit. If we just talk in terms of adults, the results are of 4 mg per year normal dose. It take about 3 minutes for the reversal. Uh, pediatric also will have the same this thing, but maybe this thing a little longer, and also in the geriatric. But the uh, causes for this little longer this thing time factor is because of the distinct change in cardiac output no. in this age group. So that mm -hmm. is a distinct result and uh, the positive factor why it is looking longer in the video of the patient than it other. Uh, even in the visual impairment, you can use this drug as much as uh, to the patient until the distinct year GFR goes to less than 30. But of course, nobody takes that distinct uh, risk. But then what ends up with my renal impairment, you can safely use this drug and it almost gets distinct change uh, and change in the urine. And uh, so, so the other distinct comorbidity also describes safer drug. So considering the distinct the comorbidities and the distinct its uh, effect, the drug effect and its final execution, mm -hmm. and the relation of the distinct reversal of this drug, I think it should be a very, very promising drug. But it's only it is limited to unusual. Don't try to use it in any other distinct drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, unnecessarily because then you might say, to, okay, I use this and then I'll go to my others. But then this one going to work. So keep it in your mind that it has a limitation of using only the unnecessary duration. So that's why I comment on the distinct. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. We'll uh, now uh, go to our question and answer session. I would mm -hmm. request Dr. Anita Nete, madam, to go for question and answer. Nete, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. There are uh, actually many questions on uh, Sugamadex, but uh, Manisha, madam, has already answered in the chat. But uh, shall we take some of them which are uh, fre more frequently asked? Now, uh, also, Kondvika Madam has answered some of those questions. That do we really need to monitor talk before using Sugamadex? That is one of the questions. And uh, uh, actually, it is controversial. Uh, Dr. Kondvikar seems to say that uh, you must monitor talk if you want to use Sugamadex. And uh, but uh, many of the people who use Sugamadex, I have been talking to them. What they do is. Um, if they feel that the patient is in light plane of uh, anesthesia, uh, and anesthesia means light plane of muscle relaxation, they directly give away two milligrams per kilogram. 
and if they think the patient is deep then they give 4 mg so manisha do you want to uh, take this that do we um, always need to monitor tof before using sugamadex or we can go by the um, respiratory attempts looking at the respiratory attempts of the patient thank you anita and about you mentioned that it has been recommended what madam has said correctly that it has been recommended to use tof while you reverse with sugamadex but if you say clinical recovery like it also depends on the availability also if it is available in all the setups and all i'm not really uh, sure whether it will if it will be available in all private setups maybe institutes or teaching hospitals it will be available but if when you mentioned that there is some recovery from neuromuscular blow that means the talk must be too so clinical yes. your clinical judgment is also very important rather than just uh, depending upon the tof ratio or monitoring of on the or on the monitoring systems so if you see there is some kind of clinical recovery from the neuromuscular blockade and your clinical judgment is perfect then i think you can go ahead with uh, 2 mg per kg dose of rocuron uh, sorry so come dr anita yeah. dr anita can i just come in yes sir please please yeah so no uh, uh, regarding the use of uh, sugamadex i routinely use tof monitoring for every patient listen it is an essential monitor here we are talking of objectifying it there is no question of judgement the dose of sugamadex is based on the number of twitches on tof mm -hmm. if you have got zero twitches on tof you have to give 16 mg per kg if you have got two twitches on tof you can give 2 mg per kg so now if there may be some jerking movements how do you know how many twitches are there so best is to be yeah. objectified and use a tof monitor and only then you give sugamadex yes, i would like yes, you sir. to use a tof monitor even for neostigmine because i use it even for yeah. neostigmine exactly yeah because yeah. See, we are not only because i am in a teaching institution my student's thesis is on uh, sugamadex and mm -hmm. she has done uh, a very large number of cases the basis of choosing the dose is the number of twitches of tof so i think the company who is selling the tof i think we it is the onus is on the anesthesiologist to try to procure a tof monitor it is as important as a saturation probe and a etco2 if you ask me because i am 100% sure that if those two twitches are there i have given by dose then that question of whether it was enough or should i give little more or all that doesn't come into my mind at all absolutely okay, absolutely agree with take. you okay. yes sir absolutely agree point. with you Okay. That we have to use TOF, and I am using TOF for uh, sugamadex reversal. But definitely, it depends upon. See, we are not talking. We, we are. Uh, you said it correct. That should be the answer. But then, as Anita Madam said, that uh, if there is no availability of TOF machine, it has to be there. Everyone should procure it in their OT if they want to use reversal of anesthesia. In fact. but then it also depends on the availability so clinical judgment will also matter if it is not available that's what i want to say because many of the private practitioners who are uh, doing freelancing practice may, uh, do not have even the access of etco to monitor source so and they are managing traumatic brain injuries in uh, private or the interiors of maharashtra for for them if you recommend uh using uh, getting top procuring top it might be difficult so that is why the take home message Yes, it is what you said. The take home message should be that top should be monitored, and you should try to procure it. But at the same time, clinical judgment. If you feel that patient is having adequate showing some kind of good recovery from neuromuscular block, you can plan your neuromuscular blocking agent accordingly, and then also you can use it because uh, that's what I feel as far as the practicing anesthesiologist are concerned. Yes. and uh, no madhuri practical ji and uh, dr rajesh i feel as we are now speaking on the forum of sams we should make sure that the overall quality of care all over the country if not maharashtra we should is uniform try, try to invest in all these monitors otherwise there is no point if we are going to give this talk, these talks and then people continue to find loopholes because now i know that even etco2 is just desirous in the monitoring guidelines it is absolutely not acceptable to a person like me now people like bhavani shankar khodali and all that we are all using etco2 also in perioperative in nora settings out, outside the operating room 
so we must sort of at some stage some take some decision try to make a cheaper version available or tell those companies who are selling those drugs to try to make it uh, available as you don't require very fancy expensive equipment something reasonable so even a private practicing anesthesiologist should be able to have access to the monitor or the hospitals where they are working they should the surgeons also should insist that they want it what do you say how did pulse oximetry come in how did ecgo to come in we are talking of hypotensive prevention monitoring and all that so, so those are very expensive but these are basics which i think we should not compromise my personal uh, view can and just uh, just a come uh, a question from everyone since there are a lot of practitioners over here private practitioners uh, and uh, Sugamadex is being used regularly. Can I speak? Oh, sorry. Uh, just, yes. I, I just want to know how many people use it for pancuronium. Madam, no, I think... Any experience with pancuronium? Nobody uses pancuronium. It is not available most of the places. Now okay, okay. So long case, y'all don't use it in per periphery pancuronium. Okay, mm -hmm. but... I was just thinking that. Is, is there anybody who uses pancuronium here? I think the cardiac people use it still, don't you? No. No, it it's available. not available. No, no, no. It's it is available. available in my place, but uh, we are not using it. It is available. Few patients, okay, few, few, uh, few people are still using it. But it is not uh, routinely used now, the way it was used in 19, uh, 2000, 1990s to 2000. Interesting. Yes. So, uh, uh, thank you for, the, sir, for pointing out that uh, what from forum we must tell what is ideal. And uh, yes, fully we agree with you that it is uh, important to use top monitor when you are using Sugamadex as well as Neostigmin, actually. <laughs> and uh, so we take another next question. How slowly Sugamadex is to be given? Uh, yes, Manisha, madam. How yeah. slowly? So it should be given not very slowly as the way we give new statement. It has to be, somebody mentioned in the comments that it, it has to be given over 10 seconds and all. Whatever books uh, are mentioned is that it has to be given rapidly. Be aware of bradycardia that may occur because I have seen pulse rate going down to up to 40 uh, in one patient on whatever cases I have used. So be aware of bradycardia. Give it rapidly, but not over the time, not like you have to monitor hemodynamics when you are giving Sugamadex. Yes. And there is another question that what is the dose of Sugamadex after the residual or inadequate effect of neostigmin? I mean, they have given neostigmin and there is inadequate reversal. And then you use Sugamadex now. And is there any dose for such situation? It will that again depend on the top ratio. Yes, but it will again uh, depend on the doctor. Sugamadex will not change at all because the uh, mechanism of action of Sugamadex and Neostigmin is totally, totally different. different. Yes, Sugamadex will encapsulate rocuronium and re remove it, and Neostigmin will act only on NM junction. So, uh, Sugamadex actually has no action on NM junction. So, it will uh, still be a full dose even if you are using after a partial reversal of news. For such cases, definitely when there is inadequate reversal or partial recurrentization, it is always better to monitor TOF and then give the dose of Sugamadex. Yes. But as uh, Dr. Raj, uh, Joseph says, yes, on the SAMS platform, we have to say the ideal the ideal thing that has been followed all over the world. So yes. on top for all the cases, yes. Yes, yes. Actually, in some of the articles, they mention that when you have a third TOF twitch, uh, that time the patient has good spontaneous breathing. And when you absolutely have no respiratory attempts, then the first TOF response hasn't appeared. Uh, and uh, when you have, uh, I mean, immediately after giving relaxant, no PTC has appeared. So that is what they have correlated. But of course, here we are saying that we must monitor TOF and uh, uh, before giving Sugamadex. Yes. So there is one more question and I think you have already answered that how much Sugamadex to be given in obese patients. It again depends upon, I feel it should depend upon the ideal body weight for that age. This is because again you are monitored, the Sugamadex dose 
there is still controversy whether you should go for actual body weight ideal body weight many articles are there in the literature but whatever i feel you should go and uh, you should give the dose depending upon top as well as ideal body weight. Okay. and uh, is the sugamadex safe in pregnant patient with difficult airway i think pregnant patients i did not find any articles that has been published for the use of sugamadex in pregnant patients difficult airway as such uh, there is no role of sugamadex because we are uh, using sugamadex at the end of surgery so or difficult if the patient has difficult airway then we should go for sugamadex should not be an indication that is what i see. no what they say that in cic cic that you should uh, use rocuronium and then if you cannot yes. intubate yes yes you use in... sugamadex a higher dose 16 mg per kg yes. yes so if you are using rocuronium then definitely so we choose the muscle relaxant when there is a difficult airway and then depending upon the muscle relaxant some might be comfortable somebody has asked a question that uh, i am using atracurium and cis atracurium now if i want to switch over to uh, if i want to use sugamadex should i use uh, you know uh, now uh, vecuronium or rocuronium yes but then it doesn't act against the benzyl uh, this uh, only acts against the steroidal muscle relaxant it doesn't act against this atracurium or atracurium so if you really want to use sugamadex you want to you have to use this kind of muscle relaxant only in your mm -hmm. search for sugamadex uh, dr manisha mm -hmm. have you come across you said that it affects the progesterone molecule so have you come across any study in which it talks about uh, you know uh, any disruption in the patient's menstrual cycle or yes. any hormonal effects have you come ac across any such studies and should it be contraindicated in case you feel Is there actually, any? I mean, anything actually, about that? Actually, the studies, whatever I have published, they mentioned that it should be avoided in early pregnancy, just because it encapsulates progesterone. Okay. Yeah. There are no studies published regarding its use, safety, or use in lactation. Non-pregnant patients. Non-pregnant no. patients, it can be used for non-pregnant patients. It can be used. I didn't okay. get your question, ma'am. and regarding what i mean to say if it is going to affect progesterone if it's going to encapsulate progesterone early pregnancy may not be uh, diagnosed yes yes very early pregnancy oh. will not be diagnosed so yeah. that is where you have to be cautious that is why my mission madam oh uh, sort of you no know, child bearing age group i mean all this will come across will come out in literature as in when we start you know uh, research going on more on sugamadex so each molecule it has to if it affects one particular molecule that is where you have to be cautious so you have to ask patients whether i mean i don't know how you ask them but uh, take care about early pregnancies which uh, <laughs> i don't know something will come up some research will come up and tell us ki bhai or is it indicated or it is contraindicated so okay good but anyway that was wonderful talk uh, thank you so much the discussion was per really super carry on Ani Ani anita yes anita i just wanted to add it has been already published in literature that uh, if patient misses uh, uh, if if we give sugamadex to the patient and if the patient is already on oral contraceptive pills it is there. if we give dose of 2 or 4 mg per kg then it is as good as giving the two tablets so this has been already published yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so, yeah. so we are no way concerned that is yeah. what is the uh, yeah uh, yeah yeah and you we know. as anesthesiologists are no way concerned with the advice of uh, contraceptive method but we should remember this this is a new drug and you should ask a patient whether yeah. you are on no seats yeah no so that has to be asked when we are using sugamadex <laughs> and then patient has to be advised to use another method of contraception during that period or use don't use sugamadex that becomes simpler isn't it yeah What use the uh, uh, yeah, reversal which you are using early routinely <laughs> or very frequently yeah yeah yes. anyway this will yeah. be
this is interesting doctor vaishali vaishali madam yes wants to say something please unmute doctor vaishali yeah, yes yes yeah uh, thank you it was excellent talk manisha and uh, doctor monteri also both talks were very good um see sugama dex i want to add up uh, i have used sugama dex uh, though the recovery and the patient's uh, response is quite good but it is not given for all the patients like even if i give rock i for my first choice will be neostigmine so uh, in uh, uk also they practice the same way uh, it is only given for indicated patients and uh, like it is not a drug which is used commonly uh, maybe because of cost issue and the effects uh, the response what you get with the neostigmine if it is uh, satisfactory then no need to go for sugamadex the second one uh, for iras uh, what uh, has been practiced now is uh, like we hardly do that uh, in pre anesthetic patient is explained everything like uh, we doing uh, iraps uh, it is uh, okay uh, it is uh, uh, good communication with the patient then they are shown everything what is the, what is he going to undergo and in pre operative when patients come to hospital the fluids are given till patient comes to surgery clear fluids that is one of the part of uh, irax fasting for solids for 6 hours and clear fluids till patient comes to surgery yes actually that is uh, also my question uh, to dr joseph montero that what uh, iras protocol you follow in your institute uh, particularly for neuro patients so the okay the, in the pre operative phase i think we have not been able to implement it in every case but mainly in the short cases that come like for dk surgery like maybe an awake craniotomy or a case that will be uh, uh, admitted only for a day prior but what i want to stress on is pre habilitation just is not in the pre operative visit it is when the patient comes to the surgery comes to, yeah. and we can identify all the comorbidities so rather than only the anesthesiologist all the other physicians involved yeah, it is a collaborative approach understood so to optimize all the systemic comorbidities to make him in the best possible way i think here also most important is most uh, institutions are in a hurry and surgeons also in a hurry and the turnover should be fast so we want to also educate the surgeons to be involved in this so that they can you can nobody will see immediate results so i think uh, pre operative optimization of the patient as she said about flu fluid uh, management pre operatively carbohydrate loading can be done and it is also tapering of the steroid or the uh, 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 optimizing the dose of steroids if the patient is already on steroids and uh, then i think uh, use of the scalp nerve block using shorter acting opioids that we also are getting access to remifentanil hopefully in a month or so so use of and using uh, non opioids in the post operative period these are the small steps that we do and of course dvt prophylaxis we use those auto compression stockings which are started in the operation yeah. theater and it goes with the patient to the icu and maybe to the ward so the same set of auto compression stockings go with the patient to the icu as well as all. this has helped our icu stays are normally less than 48 hours and many of our cases like awake craniotomy they may be ready for discharge in uh, in a day or so in a day now interestingly in this place in in bombay is very difficult to get a bed in case of a readmission so we don't have to imbibe all the values of the north americans and the canadians in their protocols of discharging the patient fast because to get a bed in the hospital is extremely difficult so i will be more happy the family also will be more happy that if the patient has come for this very big operation they don't want to go through this process of rushing about too fast so it is not fast track anesthesia it is i think the emphasis on pre habilitation and taking little more care yeah. in the post operative period this cardio pulmonary testing is also an important more than the fluid management yes. cardio pulmonary testing doing the 6 minute walk test trying yeah, to yeah, improve yeah. the muscle strength we are also focusing on frailty frailty assessment assessing the vulnerability of the patient in that way 
all these are the small small steps that we are trying to take we have not established a protocol yet but we are working on it and as okay. i said that is why we also collaborated with the colleagues in tata memorial because we will require a little bit of a larger group of collaboration not only between institutes and in like the larger volume of people to get together as dr bodwilkar was saying maybe you should form a group of people so that we will be able to take it on a bigger scale ahead one person may not make a difference one institution also cannot do much but uh, i think yeah. at a larger scale of things we will be able to implement this but in our own small way whatever we have started we are doing so do you use any pharmacology a uh, prophylaxis for dvt or only the precious stocking we prefer to use only the pressure auto compression stocking because the risk of bleeding yes so in no uh, sir uh, i differ in that i'm sorry to say but uh, it doesn't uh, affect much with your fragment 0.5 uh, ml because it is better to use chances of dvt are very less uh, uh, means abroad they use for all the patients uh, stockings with clotron and then uh, dvt pharmacological dvt prophylaxis and uh, one more thing to add up on that uh, with this we, uh, excuse me, no excuse me we don't use it in the immediate post op not in the first 48 hours after no, that in the evening, the evening in the evening evening oh, you can give sir point five will not bleed element I, I, i will disagree with you here vaishali this yeah. is because many a times for brain surgeries they keep a drain and with that drain uh, in the brain or in uh, below below the dura mater it is not advisable to start low molecular weight heparin so usually the surgeons are also not eager very much eager they are also not at all agreeing that we should we start uh, heparin in the first 48 hours yes, later on hours. yeah later on the newer agents are also oral agents are now av av available all anticoagulants like levorexaban and for a quadri for a spine patient who is quadriparatic or a hemiplegic patient definitely it is uh, given uh, after the settling uh, of the general condition of the patient and okay. i also no, no, I, I, absolutely agree with you regarding use of sugamadex yes it is available nowadays but the cost factor is prohibiting us for use in all the cases so it is always it is always better to select the patient in him or uh, in whom we would definitely use sugamadex that is what my view i'm not using it in every patient but for selected cases definitely i am using sugamadex yeah. yes actually for orthopedic or other surgeries we uh, actually Use do like start with molecular weight heparin but i think for neuro uh, we must be having some different uh, guidelines podwil kar yeah. madam has to add something madam and to say something podwil kar madam madam unmute kar so oh, madam then Hello. Can you hear me? Please. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Uh, uh, two things. Uh, as uh, we are talking about the viral cream ablation, see most of these new patients they already catechised because they haven't read they are on the right school discipline period earlier in life. So they are already in on the catabolic state pre-operative. Okay. And even otherwise, in the other patient, because he is undergoing the surgery, that step itself causes to this thing, you know, metabolic changes, pre-operative itself. His whole metabolism has shifted towards the catabolism. Over and above that, to this thing, the starvation. If it goes more than six hours, there are a lot of changes happening in the metabolism, and the patient definitely this thing develops with various mechanism insulin resistance. And that is the most notorious culprit, which causes delayed recovery and the outcome at the end of the surgery. I have recently been reading on these topics in surgery. So insulin resistance in the intraoperative period and postoperative period has actually began in the preoperative period because there is a prolonged starvation, because the patient has been kept in BM for long period, or he is not been eating well in preoperative because of the illness. So I think we have to individualize the case and we have to give a lot of importance to this. Giving the uh, car brings the ultrasound studies on this topic has actually established those fluids do not remain in the stomach more than two to two and a half an hours. So there is no harm in giving the car brings to these patients at least three hours prior to surgery in our setup. If we are sure this thing worried about that, the, whether they will cause any aspiration. Or whether they will cause any macular aspiration or they will cause any pulmonary problem. So, uh, 
recently I've been extensively reading about this topic, so that, that, that is the thing that I wanted to add, and we should not really be worried about it. In fact, we should keep our patients really fed, but in the first place. That should be our attitude when we are putting our patient for anesthesia surgery in the theatre. That is one thing. Uh, regarding the sugar medics that we are discussing, see, why all the time we are talking about the cost? As I said, that are millions of people seeing money we are spending on the surgery. Why you have to be saying worried about that 1,000 or 2,000 rupees on the sugar medic? So forget about it. Get that cancer out of your mind. And uh, top monitors are also independently available. They need not, you need not have the workstation where it is incorporated into machine itself. But then they are independently available. Before I had the workstation, I had a separate monitor. Wherein I could I, I used to judge the distance of monitor. So if such a case goes to catch up your uh, say court of law regarding reversal as the question comes, the judge will ask you, did you have any means of existing establishing that the patient really had the distinct clinical recovery? How did you just that? Then you have no say. Tomorrow if you, it's like, you know, like, uh, there's this one case uh, which I read, uh, uh, somebody using uh, uh, Bupiwakin and uh, Nigo Bupiwakin. So it was asked whether you had a safer drug to use this patient, which could have prevented this particular calamity. You have no answer. It is available. It is available at the distinct, in the city, in the country, in the distinct. Why is it not made available to this patient? So, you, you, you have to safeguard your interest, your head also from the catches of medical legal distinction. I am all, all the time emphasizing on this because as our patient safety is important, our safety as a professional is equally essential. So do use these drugs very cautiously with a lot of thinking, with a lot of discipline, logic and science into it. So let's not actually, if UK does not give, US it does not give, but what we do it here, what is available, can we afford to do it, can I invest in that, you invest in that in any of the equipment for your distinct practice, will be a long term benefit, then no, I can't afford it. Now she said that the UK, they are doing head injury, now I am sure that the force of head injury is in cases, the surgeon must be charging bomb. And then why can't you have the simple monitor? Why can't you have the distinct top person monitor with you? This will tell you that. Yeah, you agree, you agree to with you, Kondilkar, madam, that we must invest in a good equipment. And if the surgeon is having all those costly equipment, we must always have what is required for the patient safety. Uh, really, uh, fully agree with that. One last question to Montero, sir. One uh, person has asked. Patient may bite the tube and become hypoxic if you, uh, I mean, with ERAS protocol, the patient coming out very fast. So, what uh, uh, are, you, are we doing about that? Montero, sir. No, no, I didn't get the question. You can tell me. <laughs> sir, the question the one is the ERAS recovery. protocol. One minute. ERAS to, uh, the ERAS protocol is not about fast tracking and waking the patient up faster. It yes. is about. Okay. I told you, improving the outcome. Now, yeah. uh, regarding this biting the tube, I think uh, that is a certain issue altogether. But uh, if you are talking about an early reversal or an emergence, then uh, you can put a bite block in, in such yeah. a way. Yeah, if your patient is waking up a uh, little faster or something, you can put in a bite block. We put a mouth guard also to prevent the biting of the tube. We always do this. You can put a uh, two. Uh, you can put a put a prop between the molars to prevent the patient of biting the But that is not that is a separate issue. Yes, sir. So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Montero sir and Dr. Manishi Katikar madam, for excellent lectures and uh, great inputs from uh, Dr. Devujari madam and Dr. Kondilkar madam. So, uh, Rajesh, uh, yes, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, this was a very uh, excellent webinar uh, with the lectures on by Dr. Manish Katikar, ma'am, and Joseph Pantere, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Katikar, madam, and Joseph, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dev Pujari, madam, and Bharti Konvilkar, madam. Bharti, madam, taught me in my PG days in JJ Hospital. She made our concept very clear about the neuroanesthesia. Thank you, madam.
थैंक यू डॉक्टर बालाजी डॉक्टर अनिता ने थे मैडम फॉर कंडक्टिंग क्वेश्चन एंड आंसर सेशन डॉक्टर विकास डॉक्टर शिल्पा एंड ऑल रिस्पेक्टेड ऑल सीनियर एनेस्थेटोलॉजिस्ट एंड माय फ्रेंड थैंक यू सैम्स थैंक यू वेरी मच स्पेशल फॉर फ्यूचर थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू थैंक यू बालाजी सर थैंक यू वेरी मच नगर पुलिस थैंक यू गुड नाइट गुड नाइट एवरीबॉडी गुड नाइट गुड नाइट Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Door meeting end, Garuka. Oh.